me y'all that was fantastic i love it i i wonder am i gonna have to like skip worship just so i can get here and focus on the sermon i my contacts almost popped off my eyeballs i had to sneak to the bathroom blow my nose four times god is here and it is awesome happy mother's day happy mother's day how about that breakfast what who agrees to do that every sunday awesome awesome we want to thank all those who had a long morning and a hard preparation week putting this together. Some even had work today, came in early, and had to go back to work and stuff, still showed up. So God bless you. That is awesome. Um, That sends a loud message to the world when believers come together and love each other. And we open the doors to the community and say, hey, we're one beggar telling another beggar where we found great food. In this case, literally. And it was fantastic. So I want to wish a happy Mother's Day. And to my mom, I know you're watching at home. Love you, mom. Wish I could be with you, but happy Mother's Day to you. And this is the day that the ladies love and a day that the men struggle because we don't know what to do to show that love. Sometimes we struggle to show, like, what do we buy? And so I did some research. So men, this is for you. Okay, ladies, you don't even have to listen to these next two minutes. But I found a letter. It's a father's advice to his young son who's about to become a dad. And he says this, Dear son, I write to you today as you and your wife draw close to starting a family of your own. I want to share with you some wisdom from many years of experience of what not to buy your wife. Trust me on this. Do not blow it here. Many a man has felt extreme frigid temperatures for extended periods of time based simply on the wrong gift choice. As a veteran of these wars, I'm still not sure what to buy my wife 25 years later, but I can pass on what not to buy her. Number one, do not under any circumstances, buy anything that plugs in. (laughs) Anything that requires electricity will be seen as utilitarian or useful. In fact, just avoid all things useful, son. If the gift actually serves a purpose, let that be a clue. Don't get it. It will not be welcome. Trust me, the new fandangled life-changing gizmo that promises to save her hundreds of hours in her life is not going to win you any points. Number two. Don't buy clothing. Goodness. Don't buy, in fact, don't buy anything that involves sizes. <laughs> the chances are scientifically proven to be one in 7,000 that you will get her size right. And your wife will be offended the other 6,999 times. Don't do it. If you guess too big, <laughs> she will look at you through clenched teeth and say, do I look like a size? Fill in the blank. But apparently, if you guess too small, You are also in trouble, son. Evidently, this is offensive. She will look at you, likely through clenched teeth again, and say, you know I haven't worn that size since I was four. (laughs) And while we're on this topic, son, just don't buy anything that involves self-improvement or weight loss in any way, shape, or form. Trust me on this one. No matter how much you want her to be healthy and live a long life with you, the six-month membership to the diet center and the gym will not go over as planned. Trust me, in the immortal words of the great Luke Skywalker, this is not going to go the way you think. Listen to the wisdom of the Jedi's. And lastly, if you think of playing it safe, (laughs) you're doomed here too. If you are even remotely considering buying her jewelry, don't. Don't buy jewelry. The jewelry your wife wants, you can't afford. (laughs) And the jewelry you can't afford, (laughs) she don't want. Anyway, I hope this helps. Go get them, Tiger. Love, Dad. (laughs) Oh, wow. So on Mother's Day, preachers face a dilemma because what we do is we naturally gravitate towards these verses that that showcase women at their best. And we want to instinctively go to like Proverbs 31, right? The virtuous woman. She's awesome. We've got these beautiful high standards in Scripture and these lofty goals, and they're awesome. The problem is that it's so fantastically perfect in this great thing that a lot of times we inadvertently make the ladies leave feeling worse <laughs> than when they came. So today, we're going to do something different. Shocking, I know. We're going to go the opposite direction. We're not going to pretend that we're awesome and that everybody's perfect and hold this high standard. We're going to go and look at a life-giving passage of Scripture that is one of my all-time favorites. We're going to go the opposite direction. And we're going to look at some things. 
where we can be real, where we can take our masks off. Because at the potter's hand, you are safe here. Nobody has to pretend to have it all going on. You can sit back and relax. You can pull your table up to you, get your coffee, get your eggs and your bacon, your Bible, your notes. That's one of the hallmarks of our church are these tables. And we want you to sit back, relax, and take your mask off because as your friendly mayor of Realville, we're going to deal with real issues and real problems because let's be honest, we live in a broken world among broken people, right? Broken world, broken people. You don't have to pretend to have it all together. In fact, let me have my helper bring me my stuff. If we got somebody designated, I want to I wanna show you guys something. Because when I think of the word broken and brokenness, we don't talk about it much. So what I bought here is a glass Pyrex jar, or a bowl, mixing bowl, if you will. And one of the things we do, and there's Caden, go ahead and bring it on up here, my friend. When we break something, what do we instinctively want to do? Call Cademan, right? No. <laughs> we want to sweep things up. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, I want you to count down with me, three to one, and we're going to break this. Okay, if you're on the front row, just kind of close your eyes a little bit. Three, two, one. Oh, forgot to tell you, this is plastic. So it's not going to break. But if it had, what would we do with this? We would scoop it up, right? Don't go anywhere. And we would put these broken pieces aside, and what would we do? Would we glue them back together? Most of the time not. Most of the time we hand, thank you, buddy. Good job. Give Cayman a hand there. This is, this is a perfect example of what we do with a disposable culture. We scoop things up when they've lost their usefulness, and we throw them away, right? We throw things away. We, we, we think, oh, their value is diminished now. It's shattered. It's broken. It can't be any good. We do it with everything. We even upgrade things that's working perfectly fine. Hello, iPhone 59. Or Android, whatever number they're on. This is what we do. In fact, we're called the throwaway society. Did you know that? That's our nickname. Because we use things up and we throw them away. It's a disposable culture. We throw things away, but guess what? Not Jesus. I love this. Jesus sees through that brokenness and he sees something valuable. When he looks at each one of us, this is not just for the ladies now. He sees us, warts and all, as something magnificent. A masterpiece in his hands where he will mold it and make something beautiful and of value through our brokenness. And that's what we look at today. So turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at a very powerful, powerful passage. And while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. I was told last week we had 23 people streaming with us on various platforms while the sermon's going on. That is incredible. So I want to welcome our guest online each and every week. We're going to start in verse 36. This is, this is so good. I, I've, I have been chomping at the bit to get to this this week and share this with you. Follow along, starting in verse 36. He says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come over and have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and he sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him over saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him right now. She is a sinner, right? It's such a bold word. She's a sinner. Right? You're just like, dun, dun, dun. Well, we're, we're all sinners. And what judgment is going on in this passage of Scripture from some supposedly good and righteous people? A room full of likely Pharisees. Jesus has been invited over to this house of Simon. He's a religious leader. And as a religious leader, it's very common to invite the visiting rabbi to come to your house for a meal. In this case, Jesus. And no doubt he's probably heard him speak before. But we see right away, Simon's heart is a little off here. Simon the Pharisee, it's not Simon Peter, this is Simon the Pharisee, okay? He is a little, he reveals his heart right away because he's almost like not wanting him there. And he, he, he shows his heart right away with little things, like not even giving him a proper greeting, as we'll see in a minute. I mean, he, this would be like the casual, uh, if I invited you over to my house, I'd be looking for you, I'd be waiting for you. And if you came, I'd come, I'd 
give you a handshake or something. But in this case, this would be like you arriving at the door, and I'm like flipping through the channels. I'm like, uh, it's you. It's open. <laughs> Come on in. Get me a Diet Coke. You know, and it's so, do you see the difference? There's no greeting. This would be a usual kiss of greeting at the door for a Jewish family. This didn't happen. Once he came in, this is, it, it, from then on, it's, it shows you Simon, his heart is not soft. It is not what the Lord is, is needing compared to this other lady who comes in. But it doesn't stop there. I've got to remind us what these roads were like back then. Roads back then were nasty. They weren't like roads we have today. This is long before the, the peak of good living. This is long before the Jerusalem, Make Jerusalem Great Again rallies. This is going back to when they were filthy and dirty and muddy and nasty. And there were horses and donkeys that walked these roads, and they always left behind these surprises. And people stepped in it, and they walked. So when you got to somebody's house, at the very least, you had a basin of water and a pitcher and some towels. And if you were a good and righteous godly man, like we'd hoped this Pharisee was, he would get up, and he would go over, and he would pour the water, and he would wash this guest's feet. An average man would say, hey, my servant's going to get that for you. Let them take care of that. A, a totally wicked, just a lame guy would say, there's the basin of water, there's the towels, help yourself. Simon doesn't do any of those three. He doesn't do nothing. He totally ignores this guy. That's the minimal thing. And then if you really wanted to honor your guest, you might give them a little bit of olive oil for anointing their hair and their head to slick it back, to get it out of their face as they sat down to eat. That's an a inexpensive but a hospitable gesture. Simon does not die. None of that. And he knew better, church. He knew all of these things. He does nothing to honor Jesus. What is up with that? What is going on in his heart? But then everything changes. This is so good. In verse 37, a woman enters the scene and things get awkward. And I love it. I love awkward scenes like this. This lady comes walking up. And according to this passage, she's a sinner. If you want to know what the original word was, it means she was a lady of the evening. Okay? And, and, and here, here's the mind-blowing part. She was known to be like every guy in that room somehow knows this lady and knows what she does. For, now, does that seem a little odd to anyone else? I don't hang out with a ton. Of, I don't know too many. Everybody in this room knows. And they walked in, they're all like, well, do they, how, how well do they know her? We don't know. But all I know is they're looking down and things are getting awkward and they're cutting their little steaks and they're eating their little kimchi or whatever they eat. And they're having their good time. And things, you could probably hear a pin drop and cut the tension with a knife. Because this lady... Guess what? We, we forget this. She wasn't invited to this party. Not in a million years would this lady ever get an invitation to be with this group of people. Y'all, that, that alone is sad. That their hearts were so jaded and so puffed up with pride that never would somebody like this get an invitation. I can tell you who Jesus would seek out. We're about to see his heart right here. Something happened in her life that she just had to come see Jesus. Something had to compel her to come into a room, let's be honest, where she has no friends, where she is going to be feeling those stares, those rejections, those things, and then she's about to do something that is incredibly unacceptable, something incredibly reckless. She does something that is so amazing. She approaches, she stands at the filthy feet of Jesus, and everybody gets quiet. She feels their stares of condemnation. Their eyes may be turned down, and they're so embarrassed by her presence, but Jesus isn't. He already seems to know why she's here. It's almost like he can sense the change in her heart that's happening, and apparently isn't happening in anyone else's heart in that judgmental room. But he senses something. I don't know if it was a kindness in his eyes. Scripture doesn't say. I don't know if it was a tenderness in his smile or a non-condemning look, but there was something of kindness in Jesus. And he looked at her, and he said, I am not horrified that you're here. I am happy that you are here. You are welcome. Ignore all these people sitting around this table. And they, all this went unsaid. It was such a powerful moment. So she bends down, and this, this acceptance and forgiveness obviously washes over her, and it begins to melt her soul. You know how you can tell? Because she cries and cries and cries. Enough tears to start washing feet. She missed the basin. Nobody offered it to Jesus. She comes and she starts crying and the forgiveness starts to flow and she is just, just gushing right here at his feet. 
And then she stops and notices something, and I can imagine her eyes get wide with horror. She looks down and she says, why are his feet now turning to mud? No one has washed the Lord's feet. His feet are sitting, he's the only one that has unwashed feet. What is wrong with these people? And it, it had to shock her. So guess what? She's crying these tears, and she's seeing it, and she sees what everybody else missed. And that's the amazing paradox about tears. Only when they fill our eyes can we finally see things clearly. And that is a beautiful truth that this sinner is about to teach these men. Don't miss that. She looks down and says, his feet are unwashed. I'm going to take action. I know what to do. So with her tears, she begins to wash his feet. Guess what? She doesn't have a towel. Simon doesn't go, mm, I see you're in the middle of a washing ceremony. May I get you a towel? I just went to Walmart, and I've got this nice one here. Nothing. So guess what she does? She does something that is unheard of. She lets down her hair. Church, if you didn't study ancient Judea, you didn't do that. This is a, a, a special, almost intimate gesture between a husband and a wife. This is a beauty routine that is reserved for the intimacy of, of a husband and a wife. And she's doing that here. You just didn't do that. That's reserved for something special. When she does that, begins to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Can you talk about awkward in that table? Those Pharisees, they're just like, mm, man, they're sawing away on that filet mignon. Like, oh, this is so, who invited her? What is she doing here? She should be so embarrassed. And they're like, Jesus is thinking, no, you guys should be embarrassed. She shouldn't be the one left having to do all this. And then she's not done. I love this. As you read the scripture, it says she has a bottle of perfume. Maybe she kept it around her neck. We don't know. Maybe she used it in her profession. We don't know. What we do know is it's rare and it's expensive. So what you would do is usually take it and use just a drop. She doesn't do that. I imagine she just dumps the whole thing out. Not a drop at a time. She just pours it out, just dumps the whole thing out. She's pouring it out. Her whole life, figuratively here, just empties out at his feet because she is broken. Do you see what's happening here? This is so powerful to me. In front of all these stuffy, self-righteous churchgoers, synagogue people, all these Pharisees, her life is being poured out at the feet of Jesus, and it is inappropriate, and people are shocked, and it's impulsive and messy and reckless, and Jesus says, it's none of that. It is beautiful to me. You know why? Because Jesus sees the broken as beautiful. Let that sink in, church. If you are here today and you feel like a broken mess, welcome. You are in great company. And you're not alone. And this is a beautiful thing because the world tells us, man, we're supposed to hide our brokenness. We're supposed to take our broom and get those, those little fragments and put it up. We're, we're fine. Nothing to see here. We're great. Never mind the fight you had in the car with your kids to get to church. We're going to go and worship God. We're going to have a great time. Good in there. How you doing, Pastor? What's up? It's a beautiful day. I love bacon. <laughs> now we can all rally around bacon. So Simon is here. He's this respected Pharisee, and he is about to reveal a little bit more of his heart, if you look for it. This is, this is amazing. Simon, he doesn't even say this out loud, apparently. He says his thoughts were perceived, which is, shows you the, the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus. Simon says, hmm, if this guy were really a prophet, he'd know who this was touching him right now. And immediately, Jesus looks at him, perceiving his thoughts. And I love this. He says, Simon, I got something to say to you. Can you imagine Simon? You know he swallowed hard. You know the blood drained out of his face. But Simon tries to cover it. He's like, <coughs> say it, teacher. Say it. Dilly dilly. We're all here. Say it. Say it. Speak on. We're, we're amongst friends. We're all the righteous people. Look at what happens next. Verse 40. So Jesus answered Simon's thoughts. I love that. Simon, I have something to say to you. Well, go ahead, teacher, he replied. Then Jesus told him a story. I love this. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Now, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I love, don't miss this. I love his answer. I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. And there you have it. Right there, you see Simon's heart. 
You know he's panicked. You know he's thinking, why is this guy putting me on a thing? Jesus does what he always does here. He flips everything, hippity-flippity, all upside down, turns the world on its head, and does something totally unexpected. Right here, in front of all his friends, he rebukes the Pharisee, and he actually commends the prostitute. Wait, what? Think about this. He is about to rebuke him with this parable, and Simon misses half of it. He turns around, he commends the sinner, the one who's a broken mess. And he just cuts the legs out from under this proud Pharisee right in front of his friends. And he doesn't even see it coming. It's almost like he just got zinged. And he's like, that kind of hurt. Am I bleeding? I'm, I'm bleeding. Oh, my goodness. He just, he just, but Jesus did it with a smile, and he did it with truth, always with love. But he was not afraid to share the truth. And Simon's response says it all. It's two words. Can you guess which two words they were that give his heart away that reveal it? I suppose never accept an apology from your spouse when it begins with, I suppose you're offended. I'm sorry your feelings are hurt. Oh, that's not a real apology, is it? Notice the no ownership here. Notice that. I, love, I suppose, two words, give me, can you hear his reluctance? In like 15 seconds, Jesus just spanks this guy. He does it with a smile, right in front of everybody, and says, I am going to lay you bare, Simon. And Simon still doesn't get it. So Jesus goes on. Keep reading with me. Jesus says, you're right. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon. Now don't miss that. Just stop there. He turns to the beautiful woman who's sitting here, the, the broken mess. But he's not talking. He's talking to Simon. He looks at the woman and he's about to drop a bomb on Simon. And he goes on. <laughs> I love this. He goes on to say, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears. She's wiped them, not with a towel, with her own hair. Hair. Like stuff you want to keep clean on this nasty, muddy, stinky, with cow pies and stuff on my feet. She did that. You didn't greet me with a kiss at the door, but from the time I first came in, she hasn't stopped kissing. Oh, and not just my cheek. She hasn't stopped kissing my feet. Simon, you neglected the simple courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. She has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I bet it was this quiet around that table. Grenades are going off in people's minds going, what is happening here? This is the weirdest dinner party ever. Can I check, please? Can I please go? Now, don't miss this, church. There is no doubt Simon had heard Jesus somewhere. There's no doubt he'd heard him teach before whether it was a synagogue or the temple or maybe at another Pharisee's house. He's like, I think I'll have him at my house and we'll have awkward time together here. And who knows what he's thinking. But in all of this, he's never invited Jesus into his heart to forgive him, to clean him up, to change him, to break through that pride. He's happy to have him over for dinner, right? This is what David Jeremiah calls the social believers. You know what social believers are? These are the ones who are happy with Jesus out here, okay, but not here. I'm not comfortable with you. That's uh, too close. Too close. You're in my space. Back away. I want to be here. I want to keep you at arm's distance, right? Th those are the Social believers are fine with having Jesus over as a dinner guest, but are not fine with him as divine God. Well, that's, that's two different things. So I got to ask. You know I do. Which one do you like? Are you cool to have him over as a dinner guest? Is your relationship with the Lord kind of out here? Kind of at arm's length? Or do you know him as the divine God, because they're miles apart. For years, all during high school, I was happy with Jesus as a dinner guest. Several things happened in my life. If you've heard my testimony, you know what took me a long time to get to welcoming him as a divine God, and it was powerful. So we look at this story. I have a trick question for you, okay? I'm giving you a heads up. This is a trick question, okay? because that's how nice I am to you today. I had bacon. <laughs> Which one in this story would you rather be? Not who, who are you most like, not who would people think you are like, doesn't matter. Who would you, if you could choose, who would you rather be in this story? Would you want to be Simon, the well-respected Pharisee, the one who has it all together? <laughs> Buffy, who has a starched shirt or robe? dresses nice, lives in a nice house, drives a nice Prius? Would you want to be him, the one who has it all together? 
and everybody thinks they want to be like? Or <laughs> do you want to be the broken mess, but the one that ends up receiving Jesus' grace and mercy and love and forgiveness? I see, you know why it's a trick question? This is where you can take the mask off, okay? It's just us, just us. The reason why it's a trick question is because if we're honest, we want both. See, we want to be well-respected. We want people to look up to us and like us. We want to have our mess together. Who does it? That's the goal. <laughs> Not quite like the Pharisee, but we want to have all our ducks in a row and have all these things lined up, doom, 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 and have, have the, the outward appearance and everything going right. But we also want to experience God's love and forgiveness and power and purpose in our life. Here's the only problem. According to this story, you don't have both. Not at the same time. The only way that you can be whole again here is through going through brokenness. This lady, she shows us that. If you want to know love and grace of Jesus deeply, you have got to find that purpose by coming to him in humility. Oh, the, the H word, pastor? You talk about brokenness, now you talk about humility? Then go back to talking about bacon. What is going on? This is such a, this is the only way to get that kind of love and acceptance and that kind of purpose is through that doorway that's marked brokenness. And that is so unpopular to hear today. But then the story ends, and it's, oh, I love this. I hope I can get through this. He ends the story by restoring this lady right in front of them, right in front of their eyes. He gives her incredible value and purpose. Read with me what happens next. Verse 47. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, okay? Don't, don't miss that. She, he's not sweeping them under the carpet. He's not saying, she's done nothing wrong. Wink, wink. Sin's no big deal. He knows how big a deal sin is because he knows what's about to happen to him, to his beautiful, innocent flesh. So make no mistake, he acknowledges the sin, okay? Her sins, though they are many, here it is, have been forgiven. So she showed me much love. But a person who's forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table jumped with joy and were so happy, they called the baptism team and said, fill the baptistry, we're going to the temple today, and we're going to baptize for this lady who was a prostitute, has repented, and she's come. Huh? Hey. What? Who is this man who could forgive sins? What? Is They're not happy about this at all. They question him. This is, this is incredible. Who is this man who goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said, I love it, he's still ignoring them. He's still ignoring it. He looks at him and says, Sweetie, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I don't know about you. Those are some words I love to hear. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. If we ever get to the point where we don't think we need that, shame on us. Our pride has risen up. So here's the good news. I think most people in here already know this, but just in case, I want to be crystal clear. If you're streaming at home and you haven't quite clued in on this or you're, you're new at this, we're all broken. We're all broken. That is the beauty of the gospel. And here's the deal. Those of you who think you're not broken, <laughs> you're the most broken, <laughs> right? If you don't think this is about you, because we see that in this story, Here's the Pharisee. He's sitting around thinking, oh my goodness, what a broken mess. She should be embarrassed. No, he should be embarrassed. And Jesus is calling him out in the way only he can. Here's how broke this guy is, okay? Let's do a little history lesson. He's a Pharisee. He grew up knowing this. By the time he's 12, he almost has the first five books, the Pentateuch, memorized. He knows them better than we do, okay? He's lived with this. This is his life. Plus, he goes around, he studies the prophecies about the Messiah, the one who's to come, he knows all 300 of them, probably has them by heart, and he's sitting there looking for the Messiah, talking about Jesus from the Old Testament, and now he's sitting at his table, the guy he has studied his whole life looking for, and this guy is sitting in front of him and he doesn't recognize it. He's sitting at a table with a cheek that hasn't been kissed, feet that haven't been cleaned, and a hair that has not been anointed. Think about that. That's how broke Simon is. He's so broke, he doesn't even know he's broke. And that's the thing about brokenness. 
The less you see it in yourself, the more you need it. I've been there. This is, this is so, so relevant for us today. You know who else talks about this? Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 18, there's something about some pot, some hand, some clay, where it's marred, and, and the, 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 the pot maker's like, oh, this is marred and clay. You know what? I'm going to squash this, and I'm going to do something better. Like, like clay in my hands, so are you, and I'm going to make something beautiful out of it. That's why we named the church the potter's hand. That's why I was so excited, to, so excited to start this church with the Rumleys and come out. And to, you know, when Amy came up with the name, the potter's hand, and we all went, that's it. Oh my goodness, this is it. Like clay in the potter's hands. Can you not make something beautiful out of what was marred? And at some point, you are just like this pot, and I'm sure you've been broken. So you have an option. You can hide the pieces. Nothing to see here. <laughs> or you can bring them to the master and say, will you make something beautiful? better out of this? Will you do something that only I, I can't and, and, and apparently only you can? And we give it to him and I almost hear the Lord saying, let me see what I can do with this. I will make it as it seems right. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story. In fact, I'm going to have our instrumentalists come up. I want to share something. I want you to imagine that you have just purchased uh, recently a famous picture. It's a painting, okay? And you've hung it in your home and it's a beautiful painting. In fact, you had it appraised, and you found out that it's worth over $100,000. But to make it even more valuable, the artist who painted this has just died. And now the value is skyrocketing. In fact, you don't even know the worth of it at this point. So you bring it home, and you have it displayed in this place of prominence right there on the wall. You get those goofy track lights, you know, and they're aimed at it. And even if all the other lights out in the house, you can have your little shrine. And this painting is phenomenal. It's cows grazing by the riverside somewhere out west, this beautiful meadow. The artist has got incredible attention to detail and depth and, and beauty, and the colors are phenomenal. And it is so beautiful and so thick. It is the thing that you walk in and see, and it's the last thing you see when you leave. So you come home from work, and you're horrified to see that your door has been kicked in and your lock is broken and petty thieves have come in and they've stolen not only that painting but they stole a few of your electronics and your new flat screen and it's disappeared but fortunately for you you were smart and you had those items marked and you had them numbered so you could tell the police so the police three weeks later call you up and say we have a lead several houses were broken into in that same area that you live and a few of them have turned up at the flea market. Why don't you go down there and see if you can identify some of your stolen property? So she gets in the car, she drives down to the fairgrounds, she's going by Dorton Arena, and it is a horrible day. It's rainy, it's terrible, not many people are out there, and a few of the booths have, have awnings, but not all of them. She's got her umbrella, she's going around, and she is getting wet and soaked to the bone, and there's mud everywhere, and she's miserable, and she can't believe she has to do this. There's no fault of her own. And she's about to give up. She's hoping against hope that maybe she could find something, something salvageable. And she sees five picture frames stacked together, leaning against the wall of one of those outbuildings in the rain. The top one, the last one, something is familiar about the frame. And she comes up, and as she sorts through them, they're all marked $10. $10. The first four look like they're from Goodwill, look like stuff that I just donate. She gets to the last one and her heart leaps. It's her painting. Ten dollars. And just as quickly as her heart leapt up, it crashes to the floor. Because as she looks at the painting, she sees that it's punctured and it's torn. There's a rip over here. Somebody carelessly didn't do it. It's been left in the rain so the colors have run. It looks like somebody has stepped on it and now there's a bald spot where the colors are gone forever. So let me ask you a question. How do you feel right here? What, what's going through your mind? Are you angry? I would be. Are you angry at this petty thief who stole this, who didn't belong to him, who trampled on it? Are you angrier at the person who's got it and doesn't know the value and doesn't care about it and is trying to sell something of inestimable value for $10? Are you mad at the world for the whole thing? Because that is not the beautiful piece you had. Or 
Are you excited about the opportunity that it could be restored? Look closely. See, this is what God does to us. The restoration. When we bring our brokenness before him. Maybe you can identify with that brokenness in this painting. Maybe your life has not turned out like you thought. Maybe you are sitting here today and you have been bruised and you're battered and you feel like, you know what? I feel just as wounded as that painting before it was restored. I want you to hear me today. There is a God who has created you, who has been searching for you, leading up to this moment, who wants to heal you, who wants to mend you, who wants to set you back on a path of restoration and value to give you that glory he intended you to have. Now, people may have failed to realize this, but God has not failed to remember your value. Just like the prostitute who came to that awkward dinner table. So God says, you know what? If you let me, if you, if, I will have the opportunity to turn your mess into something more valuable than before. Because we're all broken, but through Jesus, we're made whole. How? Here's the takeaway. Here's what I want you to walk away with, okay? This is the big idea for today. Remember this. God doesn't work around our brokenness. He works through it. And that is beautiful. That gives me hope. That gives me uh, uh, good news that I can share. So in just a moment, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand. We like to sing a final song, and the altar's going to be open. And maybe there's somebody here who just wants to come, like I did during those last three songs today, and just bask in your brokenness before a holy God who says, I see you as beautiful. I can restore that. Lay that down at my feet. Maybe you've got somebody in your family that is so broken and they, you wished with everything in you they could be here today and they're not. Come pray for them. Maybe you know somebody and you're thinking you got their picture right in your mind right now. It's their finances or their family or their children or their marriage or their career, whatever it is, their health. You can come down front and you can lay this at the altar. God loves broken people. He sees them as beautiful. Maybe you've been here for a while and you've been looking for a church. You didn't find one better. and You're looking to unite with a great broken church, with a broken pastor full of great broken people. You're safe here and you're welcome here. Just be obedient to what God's called you to do. Let's stand together and let me have a word of prayer for us and then we'll open the altar. Father, in these next few moments, God, allow us, as your family here, to just stop and pause and recognize that in our brokenness, you have the power to make us whole. You, as our potter, you can make something beautiful out of the mess we have. Our life may not have turned out so far the way we thought, but your word tells us you can, you can shine brightest in the dark. So we meet you here, Lord. Will you show us your power, your grace, your love? It's on display before us now. We thank you. Thank you that you are here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.